Um, why families seek medical attention for this, for this child or short child? Because not all referrals to the, to the clinic are short. And we have a big debate. We just had this debate in, in the endocrinology team three days ago that so many referrals are coming directly to the endocrinologist on the account that these children are short. And when they arrive, they are not short. And, and the question is, should the primary care physicians be able to filter, you know, referrals or not? Uh, still difficult, you know, to ascertain. Shorter than the young siblings, shorter in their class, gets teased, bullied, treated differently at school, size doesn't meet expectations, impediment to sports, fear that there is something seriously wrong, fear of long-term consequences, want to be sure that nothing is wrong. These are sort of, you know, uh, and anxieties you see, and concerns by the parents. And, and, and there is a big gender uh, bias. Boys are referred much more than girls. It's up in America, it's up nine to one. And I'm sure uh, um, it's the same here in, in UAE, our, our side of the world. And the, the, the sad thing is most girls who are referred are referred when they are almost around puberty time, when there's not much left. Right, um, just physiology of growth, it's from, you know, fertilization till you end, you know, and the end of, of your growth spurt. This is the famous Montbiar son. This is the uh, French Marquis who in, in, measured his son religiously from the day he was born. And it has a wonderful, actually, we follow this up to now. You can see it goes here and the very, very high velocity and then a steady state and then the puberty, which led to the um, ICP concept. So the ICP concept, you know, the stages and phases of growth, you see we have the prenatal growth, most dramatic, under the influence of maternal science and nutritional state. Insulin is crucial. And then you go to infancy, where, you know, there is rapid growth, as we said, which is mainly governed by nutritional status and the genetic endowment. And then you move to the childhood, major regular, um, um, major regulator is the growth hormone axis, and the normal thyroid is required followed by adolescents with the growth spirit and then we stop. The ICP concept is, is, is very useful in diagnosing disease, in, in making right, uh, decisions when you come to um, short people. There is this, the mid-childhood growth spurt, which you see the bump. You see the bump here, right? About six to eight years, which is said to be the, 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 the adrenal gland you know, matures with a little bit of uh, um, slight increase in, in the growth velocity. And this is usually, this is not usually, but it can be accompanied by what you know as adrenarche, where you get pubic hair, you see, some of the adrenal androgens just get, you know, uh, extra secreted and, and cause this, you know, uh, picture. So what is the definition of short stature? It is a perceived or real impairment of linear growth. Short stature is not a disease by itself. It's only a statistically defined. Height more than two standard deviation below the gender specific population is the cut level, and it's like two, you know, less than the third centile, typically 2.3, 2.3, you see, um, centile. American Academy of Pediatrics uses the second centile. If you are um, minus two standard deviation, you are one in 44 shorter than other um, children uh, of your age. Right, the key recommendations, how to practice this, we have to follow, of course, the history and physical examination. We have to follow the growth charts and the recommended growth charts under two years, the WHO, followed by the CDC growth charts. Of course, there is a lot of now, I mean, many countries now produce their own uh, growth charts for their children, but still, these are the most commonly used. The mean parental height growth velocity should be calculated to evaluate the child growth versus potential height. And the bone age is a very useful tool when, when used, and we will see this in a minute. So this is just a busy slide. It goes again, rhetoric of birth weight, you have just to follow the history and examination and especially examination for dysmorphic features, which we'll, we're just not going to you know, talk much about it, uh, maybe in one or two cases. The, the oxology, the scientific study of growth and development of children, it's just measurements have to be done properly by proper devices and you better if you are living in the same area to have the same device, the same uh, um, person doing it, if possible, or at least a, a group of trained uh, uh, people. The genetic target height, we will measure to measure the mid parental height. We have two father's height plus mother's plus 13 divided by two. And, and then, you, you, of course, you're subtracting girls 
We all know that. The mid parental height and the mid parental centile, and then we have the target range for parental height, which is two standard deviations uh, around the, the mid parental height. Now, what is the use usefulness of parental heights in interpreting child centile position? If you see this child, child, uh, this is the child here, right? And suppose this is, I don't know, you have, sorry. Um, yeah, if this child here is just under the third centile. And we have two children, one, both at the same, of the same height, but this, the, this one has a mid parental height of just about the third centile. And the other one has a mid parental height of about the 75th, 90th centile. So it makes a big difference when you, you are very worried about this guy, the one from the high, from the uh, taller family, because of course you can see he is far below the, the range, while the, the one uh, of the other family, well, you're still worried, you want to know why, but not, not to the same extent. The growth velocity, it is um, it's one of the most important, crucial factors in, in following uh, children with short stature, and the growth velocity of less than 10% for age is an indication of abnormal growth. Uh, the bone age, as we said, you know, is very important. X-ray of the left hand and wrist, and typically uh, uh, it was, um, you ha we have the, uh, sorry, we have the, um, I beg your pardon, I'll go back. Yes, um, it is radiographs of the left hand and wrist, interpretation of skeletal maturity, correlates better with linear growth value, Time and cost effective, minimally invasive, narrows differential diagnosis. The traditional ones of Tanner White House and the Pine and Grillish are now not replaced, but um, we have the computer generated, which is actually um, this one here. Um, yeah, you see, which measures the computerized, it measures every single bone that, you know, the agent, it gives a very good um, account on, on a, a very almost accurate uh, bone age. The bone age is two standard deviation from uh, um, the mean, then you consider this either delayed or advanced. Now, a short child at your door, three questions to be addressed. Which criteria should be used to defer children? And over the years, there have been um, trials of complicated mathematical you know, equations and so on to, to define you see the best way of referring children who are at potential risk. Now, we have a simple uh, one, which is three. Any child under the third centile for age, right? So any child under the third centile for age. And the second one is any child growing out with target range for parental height, as we mentioned early. So though I am growing, and sometimes you get a child on the 10th centile, but his family is on the 90th centile. He's, he's not deviating, but he's on the 10th, which is according to what criteria, he's not short, but he's short for his family, and this one should be investigated. And then the, the third category is, of course, any child deviating, deflecting, crossing centiles, that is the abnormal growth velocity. Right. So, again, what should we do? How, where do we start? Where do we go from here? Before we go from here, let's find out what are the causes of short stature. The causes of short stature are either primary growth disorders, that's me, I'm born like this. I have a skeletal dysplasia or I have a syndrome, mostly, of course, of genetic origin, yeah, that will make me short. And name it, you see, Down, Turner, Williams, give, you know, there's a big list now. Or I was born small for date, and I'm one of the 10% who did not catch up. 10% of children born small for date will not catch up, will continue to be small. So these are the primary growth disorders. The second one is the, what you call idiopathic short stature, either familiar or non-familiar. And idiopathic short stature is, a, is a still a, 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 not a very clear area because, of course, what we considered that was just they are short. It comes from a short family. There's more and more evidence now that there are genetic abnormalities associated with this, and it can go up to, you can trace it up in the, in the parents. And the third, of course, one, the most important for, for, you know, for us is the malnutrition, is the secondary growth disorders, which is basically the endocrine problems, the disorders in organ systems, and this can go, can go on, celiac disease, chronic kidney disease, any illness that can cause 
uh, um, growth failure, right? And we have metabolic disorders, and we have the psychosocial, which is uh, another area. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have it here for the sake of time. But there are so there are stories and evidence of children who are especially abused, abused children or neglected children. And when you move them to the better, in, uh, a proper environment, a healthy environment, a safe environment, their growth catch up on its own. Um, and there is the atrogenic, of course, the typical example is the use of steroids, right? Like, like the injudicial use of asthma, asthma medication, controller and steroids for a long time, high doses, and the end with short stature and adrenal insufficiency. Now, what is left here I did not mention is the constitution short stature. Constitution short stature with delayed puberty is a variation of normal. It's not because it's a happy end. Nobody, nobody at, the, at the very end, there's a lot of anxiety, but at the end of the day, these children just go into delayed puberty and they, and they catch up. Now, let's have some um, stories here. First one is a 11 year, nine month old boy, mother and father, 157172, and you can see the, the mid parental centile is about the 25th centile. We have done the workup and it's all normal, but his bone age is delayed by two years, two and a half. What is the diagnosis? Hmm? Co co Sorry? Yes, thank you very much. Yes, it's, it should be easy. Constitution short stature with almost 30 day puberty. Right, it's a diagnosis of exclusion, boys more than girls. The, physic the slow physical maturation is the hallmark. The late puberty is common, and so usually most of them will have a family history. Even if they deny, the parents will come and tell you, no, no, we don't have. And then in the next visit, they tell you, you know what? Yes, my, uh, my brother, he had a delayed puberty. My mother told me, or, my, you know, they tell you story. Born age is usually behind one or two years. Yeah. But so in the absence of any other abnormalities, all is normal. This is, and with a positive family history, it's most likely this is the case. So how would you manage this child? Reassure and observe growth hormone therapy or low dose testosterone. Reassure and observe. Of course, yeah, except in, if they children, if these children approach 14 years and they are still either not having any signs of puberty or just stuck, what we call stuck in G2, where the testicular volume comes out of the baby, testicular volume that's a three millimeter comes to four and five, and you, you measure them over six months and they are still, they're hardly moving and there is teasing, there is peer pressure, there is all sorts of problems. You can just give them a, a, a um, a small dose of testosterone, usually three to six month course. And then uh, what we call it, you see, you just turn the car is, is in, in, on, a, on, a, on a very um, cold day, cannot start in, and you give it a push, you know, you give it a push and then they, they do. So basically these, these children, the best thing is leave me alone. No worries, I will catch up. They call, are called the late broomers, right? So this is another, this is an example of, see, his, his brother, did very well from the beginning. And he was, look, look at the difference between him and his brother here. And then look at the end the result. He's even taken over because he had delayed puberty, he had more time to close. Another child, this is a um, short family, normal clinical examination, what's the next step? What do I do next? Okay. Well, the bone age is because the chronological age, right? And this is the bone age, it's stuck on the chronic age. So they don't, we usually tell, tell people the constitutional delay, don't worry, you have in store another one or two years, which will, you will catch up. And this is really what happens. But this one, what are you going to tell him? You tell him, this is you, you're just for, coming from a, a short family, right? So this will lead us to the idiopathic short stature and, and the, the classification of the idiopathic short stature is, is a bit, you know, it's a conundrum because very respected authorities We'll call this uh, idiopathic short stature. Familial short stature, non-familial, yeah, and then the CDGP, right? And others will not put the CDGP here. But anyway, so whether your family, I mean, the, the problem is if the family is short, it's easier, but it is those who are short and there's no family history and when it is normal, everything is normal. These are the ones, you know, and up till now, there isn't much of genetic, uh, um, there, is, there is a genetic testing, of course. And, uh, but the problem is, it's not always easy to do it because sometimes you don't know what to do. I mean, you go for the, 
expensive. You see the whole exome sequence, you know, that's the 13,000 uh, um, dirhams here for trio. Would you go just for microarray? There is, in our hospital, there is what we call short stature panel that, that we send these children, you know, um, to, to get it done. Again, the yield, you know, there is, there is more than 300 genes controlling a height. And there are some variations in, in these genes will not normally cause problems, but big variations in a small number of these genes will cause, will cause the problems. So growth hormone treatment for uh, idiopathic short stature, yes. In 2003, the FDA approved the human growth hormone treatment for children with ISS and the height below first percentile. It can increase the adult height by three to seven one centimeters in some studies. Now we have to ask yourself because as I said, like here in this country, it is not covered by insurance. And here in this country, you have the indications of hypercutaterism, growth hormone deficiency, and small for gestational age, the syndromes, yeah, the Turner, you know, the, even the noon, and we, we find it difficult, you know, to get it first shot, you know. But are you are going to spend like 3,000 dirhams monthly for four years, and then you're not sure for what, for three centimeters, four centimeters? So it is not, not the best. No, 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 a clear answer, you see. Remember, constitutional is not included in this. You do not treat constitutional delay, right? And here is constitutional versus familial, just, you know, to show you that, you know, he will end here and the other guy will end there. I spend so much time in these two because they are the most common cause of referrals, really, we get. And this is what we see, what people see in the primary care setting. Right, how's it going? Do we have a simpler diagnostic approach? Maybe. Right, a clinical approach to the short child. Measure and get the height, height personal time. And so it's basically based on growth velocity and bone age. If you have the two, you, the, the differential diagnosis becomes really, you know, a lot easier. Why? Because here we are. If you have a normal growth velocity and your bone age equals your chronological age, remember the causes, you go back to intrinsic shortness. That's me, familiar short stature, genetic syndromes, other congenital disorders, Right, I, I was acquired um, growth, you know, problems like spinal irradiation. But what happens if I have normal growth velocity and my bone age is behind my chronological age? Not much, as we said, usually two, two and a half years maximum. Usually, this is the constitution delay and the mild chronic diseases. The best example is mild asthma. Mild asthma is well known, you see, to cause just, you know, a form of constitutional short stature. And then, of course, they pick up it. Then we are left with the third one, what you call the atten attenuated growth, where the subnormal growth velocity and the bone age is delayed. So actually, in a primary care setting, if you gather this information, if you have your stadiometers and you measure properly and you take proper history and you do your bone age and you follow the child again, you can easily differentiate and find out which ones should be referred and which ones you can keep for yourself. Right, let's have this story. A short girl, she's 10 and a half, mid parental centile, 50th centile. And do you want any more information? I'm sure you won't. Okay. Colors easy, huh? All right. Turner syndrome. Okay, hormonal therapy and Turner syndrome. Growth hormone therapy increases high velocity. The effects are dosage dependent and superphysiological doses are required. Long-term treatment statistically improves final height. The response to growth hormone individual patients is highly variable. Optimal age for starting therapy is not established. And when they come to puberty, you know, you move. The shocks gene is the one that is located in the pseudo-autosomal region of the short arm of X and Y. And it is the one responsible for the shortness in Turner syndrome. And there is, of course, now children without Turner syndrome who just have the, the, the shocks, right? No, let's, let's cross this. We have been seeing this again. Well, another short boy, six year old, born at term, feeding difficulty in the first year of life, concern redevelopment, increased weight gain, height under the third centile. Who's the one that born normally, feeding difficulty in the first year of life and concern redevelopment? Right, sorry? Thank you. Somebody said it, yeah? So here's the one. How many minutes I have? But, but can you mind? I just, uh, I'm sorry, I do apologize because I have a small problem. Can you put this instead? Yes. 
This is the old version. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> right. The diagnosis is by the Willie, they have hypotonia in infancy and causes, of course, um, it's, it's, you can either have deletion of chromosome 15, that's, that's, that's paternal, or you can have uniparental disomy, both maternal, or you can imprint in mutations, right, where some of the material, mother's, um, you know, material, material, you see DNA material just goes onto the father, and these are three. The problem is the, the, uniparent, the, the deletion of the chromosome is the most common. And, and some, up till recently, if you ask for prader willi gene, they do the first one. So they come and tell you it's negative. If, if, it is, if, if, the, if the deletion is negative, you must go for the methylation. You must go for the two others, you know, to, to continue. Growth in prader willi rationale. Okay. The, do you have the other one? Sorry. Okay. Can you? I'm sorry. I do apologize. There, some, can we swap? Yeah, and I'll take only four minutes. Just, <laughs> I sent this earlier and. Uh... Okay. So yeah, Prada Willie, of course, there is, there is a lot of, uh, um, Oh, okay. Can how can you? I need to start from. I can use the click one by one. You will kill me, huh? Yeah, you do it from your side. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Did you reach? Yeah, yeah. Stop. We'll go back. Just uh, with dysmorphic the syndromes. These are examples of dysmorphic the syndromes. Just keep going. Yeah. Sorry. Keep going. You have to keep going a lot. No, no. Keep going. Keep going. We all went through all this. Yeah. I'm sorry, it shouldn't be done like this, but once you get to Prader Willy, keep keep going, keep going. I'm sorry. Yeah, stop. Yeah, keep going. Right, stop here. Okay. So one more short boy, eleven years old, progressive declining growth velocity. One age is eight, attenuated growth. A clue in the chart to narrow differential diagnosis. What is the clue in the chart? Yes, the weight is up and this is down. So the two things that give you this, apart from atrogenic, right? Cushing is very, very rare, right? The two things that could give you this is growth hormone, huh? Growth hormone deficiency and the hypothyroidism. So we'll do, we'll do this too, the IGF and the TFTs, right? The diagnostic path to establish growth hormone deficiency is based on history, anthropometric measures, clinical assessment, and then the biochemical test is either static or dynamic together with imaging and molecular genetics, right? So these are just the oxological criteria, which is fairly easy to find. And then this child had, you know, the, the anterior pituitary combined anterior pituitary stimulation test. And for growth hormone to be normal, you have to, to get to 10. They used to do it five before, but now it is up to 10, which makes the yield higher. The cortisol, you have to cross the 550, and it didn't. The IGF-1 is very low, and the TSH is normal, but T4 and T3 is very low. So this child has hypopituitarism, yeah? With all the three, with the, the growth hormone, cortisol, and thyroxine, you know, the thyroid failing. You treat with growth hormone, and the monitoring is by pediatric endocrinologists, where you do three to four months determination of growth response, measured of serum IGF-1, and you adjust the dose based on the IGF-1. And then you do annual bloods because you don't want them to get into diabetes, you know, and sometimes it unmasks hypothyroidism. Evaluation of compliance and consideration of dose adjustment. The side effects, leukemia, not much really said about leukemia. There's no evidence that this... You know, unless, you know, you go for very high doses and it's still debatable. The cancer of serious tumors is true. Again, if you go up 50 microgram per kilo per day, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, usually early in the course of treatment. And if you stop the medication for a while and you come back at a lower dose, usually does not recur. Sleep terminal hepatitis is diabetes, miscellaneous like fluid retention uh, um, can, can be encountered. The outcome of growth hormone therapy, this is the Pfizer famous study. 1,529, and they basically, they get into the target range, but not necessarily to the mid-parental high. 
there's not always, you see, the, the best picture, you know. Those with multiple um, uh, um, hormonal deficiencies get better results. And the bone mass, again, this is a French study for 24 months that, you know, if you do it, you see more than two years on growth hormone treatment and you get into adult life, you are um, accruing, you see, more bones and your bone mass uh, is improved. And this is this, you know, picture. This one, now girl with the, the, this is the elder and this is the younger and she has growth hormone and now she took over her sister. Now, the good news is that FDA approved just recently once a weekly growth hormone uh, um, therapy, the Lonapeg somatropine. And this is going to be once a week. And they have two studies so far which showed improvement, better outcome. Uh, time is up. Can I have one minute, Dr. Monica? Just one minute, I'm going to finish. These are the uh, list of the approved uses of growth hormone therapy in the United States. And again, just a reminder of the approach. And oh, this is the one that we mentioned, but we go, yeah, because here, and I just wanted to show you this one, last one. This is the three year old girl. What does she have? What does she have? A chondroplasia, of course. And the chondroplasia is, right, basically, you know, the FGFR3, right, is just abnormality mutation, you see, which, which means it's going to be open all the time and it hinders the cartilage formation and you end with the, if everything else is normal, right, but your, your height and you have rhizomelic proximal uh, um, we, um, short stature. Now, there is the good news is there is a new treatment for achondroplasia. Was it a tied treatment accelerate bone growth in children with achondroplasia? It was tried for one year and it showed improvement of 1.7 centimeter in the, uh, in the treated group. 60 patients were treated versus placebo 61. Uh, this is the news about achondroplasia. Summary, just, you know, common problem, please the, make sure that you have all the what is needed, you know, to do a proper primary care setting before you refer. Thank you very much. Thank you.